Well, if you have your copy of Scripture, will you take it and turn with me to the book of Ephesians? We are going to be in chapter 5, verses 15 through 21 this morning. In his book, Jesus Continued, Why the Spirit Inside You is Better Than Jesus Beside You, J.D. Greer wrote this. He said, I've always thought that Jesus gave a very odd first step to completing the Great Commission, basically telling them, do nothing until the Holy Spirit comes upon you from Luke 24, 49. With millions of people waiting to hear the gospel, he instructed the only ones who knew anything about it to sit and wait until he had sent them something mysterious from above. That meant they were not to write books. They were not to go out and try to make converts. They were not to plan. They were to do nothing. Why? Because until he came, they couldn't really do anything of value to the mission. Jesus had promised that he would build his church and he could accomplish more in one moment through his spirit than they could accomplish in 10,000 lifetimes on their own. And that's the truth. When it comes to living out the Christian life, which includes the great commission to make disciples, the undeniable truth is that we can do nothing apart from the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't stop us from trying, does it? We try to do things in our own power and in our own ability all the time. It is, we're, we're much like the ancient Israelites that the prophet Jeremiah spoke of in Jeremiah 2, 13. He said, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So many Christians and so many churches today are spiritually empty. The spirit is not there. And they are like those cisterns that have been hewed out for the purpose of containing their own ability and power and consequently cannot hold water. And we desperately need as God's people and as God's church to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need that and if we are going to try to apply the theology that Paul has taught in the first three chapters of Ephesians that we've seen as we've worked through it, then we have to have his power. Because if we don't, if we try to do this apart from the Holy Spirit, we will stumble, we will fall, and that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is apart from the Spirit, we're going to twist this into false teaching and, and present it to an unknowing people. So how is it that we can be filled with the third person of the Trinity and live life in the Spirit? Well, Paul shows us the answer to these questions in our passage this morning. And I invite you to stand with me this morning in the honor of the reading of God's Word as we come to the fifth chapter of Ephesians, beginning in the 15th verse, we read, Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Our Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that we can come to it daily, and find in it the truth, the truth about who you are, the truth about your son, Jesus Christ, the truth about the Holy Spirit, and the truth about what it means to live life in him. Father, as we move through this passage this morning and we see 
what that means for us. I pray that we would hear your word and apply it in our life so that we may be going out from here as better stewards of the grace you have given us, better ambassadors of the gospel of Jesus Christ, better laborers in the, vineyard, in the, in the fields of harvest that you have prepared, all so that many may hear the gospel and put their faith in you for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Two weeks ago, when we were last in our study of Ephesians, we saw Paul talking about what it means to shine like Jesus. And we, we noted then that that meant both to express the light of Christ in our lives as well as to expose the darkness that is around us. And throughout our study of Ephesians, both a couple of weeks ago and, and in the weeks previous, we have seen that the only way that we can possibly achieve this is by the Holy Spirit's work in our life. If the Holy Spirit is not in us, if the Holy Spirit is not empowering us, if we're not yielding to him, then we are not able to accomplish the things that Christ has called us to do. Now, we might be successful for a moment. We might be able to do a couple of things, but that long, faithful obedience that we're called to is impossible apart from the spiritual strength that we receive from the Holy Spirit. And that's why as you move through the book of Ephesians, you see Paul make several references to the importance of the Spirit in our life. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit as we see back in chapter 1 verse 13. We see that his presence in our lives is the guarantee of the inheritance that we will receive in Christ Jesus in 114. We're reconciled to the Father and to one another in him in 2, 16 through 18, and we have spiritual strength through the Spirit in 3, 16. And when we consider the context in which the church exists today, we see all the more both our great need for the Holy Spirit and God's great gift of him to us. And I know the Holy Spirit gets short shrift often. And let's be honest, especially in Baptist churches, we're worried about the excesses and the abuses that we see sometimes of the Holy Spirit. And we think that by not even talking about him, will somehow protect him from that. He needs no protecting. We need him. So let's look at what Paul says here. First of all, about the context of the church, he begins by reminding the Ephesian church that they're to look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, back in verse 15. If we're going to walk as children of light, and that's what he's called us to do back in verse 8, if we're going to walk as children of light, then we must be exercising spiritual wisdom. Now, many of you know that I have a deep love of learning. You know that I have lots of books on my shelf in my study, and, and I actually sat down and looked to see how many I have. Uh, and between my physical books in my library and the digital books that I have in my Bible study software, I have over 7,000 volumes, and, and I'm always looking for some more. Some of these, and Erin's shaking her head, yes, she understands. I'm always looking for some more because I love to read. I love to read broadly. I love to read about theology. I wear the badge of theology nerd with happiness. I'm not offended by that if you call me that. I, I, I know that that's who I am, okay? I listen to different preachers in their podcasts, and their sermons. I go to conferences from time to time to try to learn more about Christ and about serving as a pastor. I spend time in God's word. I dig in there and I'm, I'm studying it, whether it's to preach passages like this one this morning or, or on Wednesday night or just to be in conversation with you during the week. And, and for devotions, I, I have a journal that I actually write out the words of scripture in, in my own hand. And, and all of this produces great knowledge. 
But I think you all know knowledge is not wisdom. Now, knowledge is a necessary component for wisdom, but it is not a substitute for wisdom. You have to have knowledge in order to be wise, but having knowledge alone is not enough. True wisdom takes what we know about God, his ways and his plan from his word, and it results in the applying of that knowledge in how we walk in faith every day. That's what true wisdom is. It's taking the knowledge that we get from his word about who he is and about what he does and what his plan is. And it is about applying it to how we live out our lives. In other words, as Paul would say here in Ephesians a couple of times, how we walk. That's spiritual wisdom. Walking carefully, not as unwise, but as wise. And it begins in the fear of the Lord. That's what Proverbs 9.10 says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So we have to have that knowledge to begin with. And let me tell you folks something. is All the books that I have in my library can't compare to this right here. To know God. If you want to know God, go to the source this is the only accurate representation, the only accurate account of who God is and what he has done. And the, only re and the reason it is, is because it's the only book that has been inspired by his Holy Spirit. These are the word, we call it the word of God. It is the word of God. It is the words of God spoken through men who, as Peter said, have been carried along by the Holy Spirit. They've been inspired by him. So by all means, brothers and sisters, dig into God's word. Saturate yourself in it. Do as Charles Spurgeon once said, marinate in the word. Right? Just let it soak into you and permeate every aspect of who you are. But by all means, do not be content with merely knowing it. That's not enough. You have to do it. You have to live it out. You have to walk it. You have to apply it in your daily life because that's what biblical wisdom is. It's the resolve to live according to what we know is true. That's what it means to live in a wise sense. Listen, if you know biblical truth, if you're a person who studies the Bible and you do your daily reading, right? You're doing your read the Bible to in a year program and, and you read all this other stuff and you never apply it. That's what the Bible calls foolishness. If you know what is right and you do not do it, it is sin. It's foolishness. That's the height of foolishness to know what God wants and not do it. So that's not walking in light. That's not walking as children of light. That is walking partnered with the darkness. And so by acquiring wisdom, that application of biblical knowledge to life, we'll be able to exercise spiritual discernment as we see in verse 16. Paul says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. We live in a time of unprecedented leisure time. There has never been an era in human history where people have had as much free time on their hands today as they do now. It, just think of terms of food. If you go down to Meyer and walk into the produce section, this very moment, you will find all the produce you could want. Produce that is not in season. A big ripe tomato is not what you find in Michigan at the end of January, right? And yet you can go down there and find it to your heart's content. You can get apples, you can get oranges, you can get all of these things. Why? Because our technological advances have allowed us to produce more crop yields in more places and incredibly fast transportation gets it all over the world before it spoils. And so I can... Eat an orange today because of that. 
But not only does it have to do with crops, think about uh, the advances that we have in terms of industry, great efficiencies in production of both components and finished products means that we can have a 40-hour work week. And I know some of you are like, only 40 hours? Yes, 40 hours is, is typical, right? A 40-hour work week. And, and because of that, we have more expendable income, don't we? Things are easier to produce. They don't cost as much. So that means more for us to spend, more time that we have to do what we want to do. And all of this together means that we have more time than ever, and yet we are facing within the church a discipleship crisis. Because as much time as we have now, we're not spending more time in God's word, we're actually spending less time in God's word. Because all of those frivolities that surround us are, are leeching the time away to the point where we'll binge watch Netflix, but we won't read the Bible for 30 minutes. That's where we are. Now listen, I don't want to give you the idea that I'm up here railing against entertainment. I'm not. Entertainment in and of itself is not inherently sinful, depending upon what that entertainment is, of course, right? There's caveats. But just because you sit down and watch a movie doesn't mean you're sinning, okay? But if you're watching 20 movies a week, then I'm going to say, yes, you are. Because you are spending, you're, you're not making the best use of the time, as Paul says here that's actually preventing us from being in God's word and doing the things that we know we're supposed to do. You see that, that phrase, making the best use of the time that Paul uses here in verse 16, it, it means redeeming the time, taking advantage of every opportunity that comes before us to do the things that God has us to do rather than frittering away the precious time that we have pursuing things that have no eternal significance. Knowing which opportunities, and listen, there's a lot of them. Every day you and I get opportunities. Knowing which ones are the best use of the time takes spiritual discernment. It takes being able to evaluate it against the mission that God has given us and why is that? Why, why should we be making the best use of the time? Paul gives us the answer right there at the end of verse 16. Because the days are evil. Brothers and sisters, the newspapers are filled with examples of this truth. The days in which we live are evil. I don't need to go down the myriad list of examples. You know them. We are living in the last days. Now, before anybody thinks I'm trying to be apocalyptic up here and, and trying to tell you that Jesus is coming, you know, October 21st or something, I'm not. You see, the last days in Scripture are from the time of Christ's ascension until his return. The New Testament writers said we're living in the last days. 2,000 years ago. And then even some people at that time were saying, how can this be the last days? Uh, Jesus ascended 30 years ago. He hasn't come back. He's slow. And Peter says, ah, uh -uh. he's not slow like people count him slow. God is patient with us that more might come to faith in him. Praise God for that mercy that he has, that patience that he has with us. But we are living in the last days. And the Bible says that in the last days, they'll be filled with evil because people will reject him and chase after their own desires and do what is in their hearts. And we who are children of light are to be living in such a way that our lives are shining in the darkness, making the best use of the time 
And all of this can only be done by living in the Spirit. But finally, Paul says that given this context in which the church finds herself, we are to be exercising spiritual understanding. We see that in verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You know, when we went through these first three chapters of Ephesians, we saw the theology that is there. That gives us the reason why we are to be who we are. And, and all of that theology points to a, a purpose for God's people. We're to be holy. We are to be a holy people, people who are set apart for God. And now in these last three chapters of Ephesians, we see how to live out that holiness. Listen carefully to what I have to say. Holiness is the will of God for his church. Holiness is the will of God for his church. Sometimes I think we get hung up on this. What's God's will for my life? And, and we see it right here. It's to be holy. It's to be pure. It's to be following God in his will to understand what that is. And, and, and Paul's saying, look, I've already shown you what the will of God is. This isn't a mystery like so many of us try to make it. How often do we hear people who are involved in almost a paralysis of decision making because they can't figure out what the will of God is for their life? Should I buy this car or that car? Should I go to this college or that college? Should I buy this house or that house? I, I, I need to hear the will of God on this. Listen, the will of God is to live a holy life. That's what his will is. That's revealed Old Testament, New Testament, and yet somehow we expect God to give us additional revelation, another word from God about what, our, uh, what his will for our lives is. And, and as a result, we just sit idle. Listen, he has spoken to you, brothers and sisters. He has shown you what his will is. He said what his will is. And if he's already told you and you didn't listen, what makes you think you'll listen if he tells you again? Right? We don't need additional revelation. We have it right here. We need to be living this out. Because if we don't, that's foolishness. That's what Paul says here, right? Don't be foolish. Don't know what his will is and not do it. Don't know what his word says and not live it out. In the context of the, the Western church, we're increasingly finding ourselves at odds with the world, aren't we? We are beginning to look more and more different from our culture. There was a time when our culture was Christianized, and it's not that way anymore. We're actually finding in the West that what the church is experiencing today is starting to look more and more like what the church experiences all over the world. And not only that, what the church has experienced all through history. You see, the world doesn't like the church. And if we're going to live in times of increasing animosity, we need spiritual wisdom, we need spiritual discernment, and we need spiritual understanding. We need these spirit-filled lives. We often talk of cancel culture today, don't we? And we talk about it as though it's a horrible thing, but brothers and sisters, the world has tried to put cancel culture on the church since she was born. The, the world has tried to cancel the church from the beginning because the church stands in opposition to the worldly spirit. And just as those faithful brothers and sisters who came before us, we must be willing to live our lives in the spirit, pursuing the holiness of God so that our lights may shine brightly in a dark world and point others to Jesus Christ. Now, having established the context for living the spirit-filled life, Paul turns his attention to the characteristics 
of this life. What does a spirit-filled life look like? How is it lived out? Now, listen, we have to be careful here. Because if we're not, we can come to this and swerve off into the ditch of moralistic legalism. We can become uh, people who look at the Bible as nothing more than a manual for clean living. Just a bunch of instructions for do this, don't do that, and everything will be fine in your life. No, listen, there are instructions for holy living in God's word. And those who belong to Christ are to follow them. But it's not because we're trying to earn merit with God. It's not that we're trying to earn his approval. Our obedience to these commands flows out of the love that we have for Christ. Because he first loved us. Loved us so much that he didn't avoid the cross but he willingly laid down his life for you and for me so that we could be saved. And so we have to be careful not to go off into this moralistic legalism. And, and likewise, we can't come to the scripture and look at it as though it's just this book of doctrinal, philosophical propositions that are to be argued. Have you ever met somebody like that? They'll argue the, the finest minutia of theology with people, and then as soon as somebody disagrees with them, they say, ah, see, you're a heretic. Ah, you believe false teaching. No, 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 that's not what the purpose of this is either. You see, we have to have right thinking, certainly, but that has to be coupled with right living. And the emphasis, the center of it all, must be Jesus Christ. If it's not, then we swerve off the road and we go into one of these ditches. No, to live life in the Spirit, this is what we must do. We must have this, this combination of right thinking and right living centered in Christ. So with that said, let's take a look at these characteristics. First, in order to live our lives filled with the Holy Spirit, we must first pour out the worldly intoxicants that fill us. Look at verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now over the years, people have used this verse to argue for teetotalism, in other words, that no believer anywhere at any time should ever consume a drop of alcohol in any format at all. But that is not the point Paul is making here. Paul is using an example to illustrate a much larger point. He's talking about intoxi intoxication. That's a manifestation of the old self now, the most prominent and the most abused intoxicant in the history of the world is indeed alcohol. There's no way to get around that. The Bible speaks of drunkenness often and condemns it every time. And the reason for that is because it reduces our self-control. But listen, it's not just alcohol that can do that. There are a lot of intoxicants that cause you to lose self-control. It might be alcohol. There are certainly drugs that can do that. But I'm gonna tell you there's other intoxicants. Power. Have you ever heard the term drunk with power? That's what happens sometimes. We imbibe that, we want that. Maybe it's sexual promiscuity. Whatever the case is, when we consume those things, we lose self-control. We become drunk, and that is forbidden. Drunkenness is always condemned in Scripture because it leads to the pursuit of our base desires. That's, that's foolishness, Paul would say. It's, it leads to our pursuit of that rather than holiness, and holiness is to mark the life of the new believer. The old self got drunk. The new self is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the positive command that we see here. Paul's showing us that we all are going to be filled with something. We're either going to be filled with the intoxicants of this world, or we're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Which one 
are we going to choose? Which one are we going to follow and fill ourselves with? Now listen, if we fill ourselves with the intoxicants of this world, we will lose our self-control. But if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we'll, we'll experience the fruit of self-control, just like Paul says in Galatians 5.23. And listen, have you ever seen someone who's drunk? Could you tell they were drunk? Could you tell they were filled with alcohol? Absolutely. And you can tell when somebody's filled with the Spirit as well. You're going to be filled with something. What is it? One thing is good. The rest is not. Because Christian, that which fills you, controls you. That which fills you, controls you. If it's a worldly intoxicate, intoxicant, it's going to dictate and drive you to do foolish and sinful things. But if it's the Holy Spirit, he will direct and guide you to sanctification and holiness so that God may be glorified in your life. Next, the Christian who's filled with the Holy Spirit will be engaged in vertical worship that results in horizontal edification. Read verse 9 with me again. Paul says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart. As you empty yourself of the things of this world, as you get all of those worldly intoxicants out of your system and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what happens? Joyful worship emanates from you. When you're filled with the Spirit, you worship the Lord and one of the ways that we worship the Lord is with melody in our hearts, with a song in our hearts. We are created as musical people. And I know some of you might say, not me, Pastor. You haven't heard me sing. Or, or I, can't, I can't carry a tune in a bucket, right? Uh, that may be. But listen, nowhere that it talks about making joyful noises to the Lord says anything about being in tune. Now, I'm glad that our praise team is in tune. I'm glad that they have been specially gifted with musical ability. I didn't get that. That's okay. It's, it's a good thing. And, and, you know, we have... Some of you have been around long enough to remember what was called the worship wars, where people got into all kinds of disagreements over what the appropriate type of music in the church was. Some people say the only thing that you should be allowed to sing in church are the psalms. That's a position called exclusive psalmody. And they say that's it. That's the only thing that you can have. Others have said, no, the only thing that you can have are the old hymns of the church from people like Isaac Watts and uh, Fanny Crosby. And then, you know, a third group says, no, it's okay to have more contemporary music in the church. And listen, churches split over this. To the detriment of the kingdom of God, that's a shame. Because I happen to be in the all of the above camp. I think that we should sing the songs. Have you ever heard more beautiful music than that? I mean, when you read that, there is nothing more honest and, and truthful about our condition than the Psalms, whether it's joy, whether it's heartache, whether it is pain, it, it is all there and it is all focused on God nonetheless. Yeah, I, man, when I think of some of those great songs of old, Be Thou My Vision, I love singing that song. I love singing the church's one foundation. I love singing victory in Jesus. I love singing. Here's one we've never sang here, but I'd, I'd love to sometime. Just a little talk with Jesus. That one was in uh, the Heavenly Highway hymnal in, in the church I grew up in with shape notes. Uh, listen, I love that song. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Right? But I got to tell you, I, I think there is some magnificent hymns and songs being composed that will also be sung for generations today should the Lord tarry. Things like in Christ alone, how deep the Father's love for us, 
All I have is Christ. Jesus, thank you. And two songs that we sang this morning, 10,000 Reasons and Revelation Song. But notice that Paul says that these expressions are to be made to one another. You see, our, our worship is vertical, right? Our worship is to God alone, vertical to him, because he alone is worthy of worship. But when we are worshiping him in song, Together, gathered as the church, guess what? We are horizontally edifying one another. I can't tell you how many times I have stood in this worship center and listened to the voices of God's people united, singing his praises, and my eyes get a little misty. It's almost like there's allergies or something in here. I don't know, but, but I get teary-eyed hearing that. There are songs that do that, and I know that some of you have shared that with me too, that every time we sing a certain song, that's it, I'm done, right? You are in tears because you're, you're hearing this, and it is moving you. The music that the church makes in her heart vertically to God will also horizontally edify the other members of the body. And that's it. And listen, to hear a spirit-filled church lift her voice as one to God in song is just a foretaste, just a little taste of what we're going to experience when we get to heaven and we stand before the throne and all of God's people from every tribe, kindred, nation, and tongue are going to stand there and sing a new song of praise to God. Oh, how awesome is that going to be? So when you're born again, you're born with music in your heart that's used to worship God and to edify one another. But third, those who are living a spirit-filled life will possess a pervasive gratitude for all things as we see in verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you're redeemed by God, you're given a new heart. The heart of stone is taken out, the heart of flesh is put in, and the heart of flesh is grateful. It's grateful. This is one of the defining characteristics of what it means to be transformed by his grace. We have gratitude to the Father. And listen, when things are going well, it's easy to thank God, isn't it? When, when we seem to be experiencing all the blessings of life, it's easy to say, oh Lord, thank you. Thank you that I had such an easy week at work. Thank you that the kids had a good week at school. Thank you that I didn't get a horrible bill in the mail or something like that. It's easy to do that. But what about the hard times? Or even more difficult, what about the times when we experience evil in our lives? Paul says here and in other letters that we are to give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So does that mean that we're to thank God for cruelty and abuse? Are we to thank God if our spouse commits adultery? Are we to give him thanks for that? Listen, sometimes people have come to this passage and said, oh yes, that's exactly what it means. You have to, I've struggled with that. I've got to be honest with you. I have struggled with that interpretation for a long time because it's hard for me to understand how I am to give thanks to God for something that God abhors. How can I praise God for something he calls evil? I can't praise him for that, and I don't think we're supposed to. When an evil thing happens to us, we don't praise him for that evil thing. We do praise him, though, that that evil thing has driven us to be more dependent upon him. Because then we're praising God for being God. We're not praising him for the evil thing. We're praising him that we are stripping away these artifices of self-reliance. I love the way that one commentator put it. He said, we give thanks even for the darkness that makes the glory of Christ's name more evident. The thanksgiving, however, is not for the horrors of a fallen world, 
but for the name of the Savior that alone can answer and redeem those horrors. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we give thanks to God our Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the key, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, the Spirit-filled Christian will practice a self-sacrificing submissiveness for the good of his or her brothers and sisters. Verse 21 says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. When Jesus was going to the cross, he went into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And he gathered with his disciples in the upper room to celebrate that meal together. And when he got up there, he did something that was not only shocking, it was scandalous to his disciples. He washed their feet. Now, all of us here today, as I look out over, over you, I don't see anybody here who'd have dirty feet right now. Now, you may be uncomfortable if I got a basin and came out with a towel and kneeled down to take off your shoes. You might be, ah, oh, this is weird, right? I, I get that. But you have to understand the context in which Jesus was doing this. You see, to wash the feet of someone was the job of a servant. And not just any servant in the house, but the lowest servant. This is the guy who's on the bottom of the servant ladder. He's the guy who has to wash feet. And do you know why? Because when you walk everywhere in a dusty, dry land with sandals, your feet are nasty. And that's what this person had to do. Now listen, the disciples had nasty feet. And Jesus, the teacher, and not just the teacher, the Lord, lowered himself to that of a servant so that he could serve his disciples. And in that moment, of course, Peter, of course it was Peter, Lord, you will never wash my feet. This is below you. And, and he says, if, if I can't wash your feet, Peter, you have no part of me. And then Peter again, well, Lord, not just my feet, but my whole body as well. I, I want to be all in here, right? Jesus said, listen, I have something I'm trying to teach you here. We see it in John 13, 14 and 16. He says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. You see, Paul would echo this attitude of Christ in his letter to the Philippians when he wrote, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. When we are sacrificially submitting ourselves to our brothers and sisters, we're being Christ to them. We're living out what Christ has taught us to do. We're being the servant. And listen, to submit to one another is counter-cultural. That is not what this world teaches, is it? When we do this kind of sacrificing and submitting to one another, it is a picture of something that is completely different and infinitely better than what the world offers. The world offers cutthroat, dog-eat-dog, climb-all-over-each-other-to-get-ahead mentality, not submit yourself to them. Don't count yourself as more significant but count others more significant than you. And when you and I are filled with the Holy Spirit and we're empowered to live such a Christ-honoring life, we're presenting a compelling case for the truth of the gospel. So if you're here this morning and you're a believer, I ask you, are you living such a Spirit-filled life are you filling your life with the intoxicants of this world or are you being filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you reflecting the divine melodies that ought to be playing in our hearts? 
Is your attitude one of gratitude or do you grumble and complain about everything that's going on around you? Are you willing to put others before yourself, sacrificing yourself for them just like Christ submitted? If not, listen, the blessing of being spirit-filled is yours to receive if you will repent and turn to Christ and follow him. But if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, then I have to tell you, you already know what it's like in this world. You already know how terrible it is. And if you've heard me talk about this spirit-filled life and you, that sounds great, pastor. How do I have that? I wanna talk to you about it. I'm gonna be right down here as we close. We sing our final hymn. I want to tell you what it means to put your faith in Christ. So come talk to me during this time. Trust him today. Will you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we could spend in your word. And Father, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It is unbelievable, Lord, that you not only saved us, but you made us your children. You made us heirs with Christ and you have given us the gift of your Holy Spirit who resides in us permanently. He will never leave. He will never abandon us. He will always be here. And Father, through his power, we are able to do all things. Father, thank you for that. And Father, I thank you for Just the ages of faithful, spirit-filled believers who have gone on before us and who have shown us what this means. Father, may we abandon our self-reliant ways today and, and admit that we can't do this on our own. That the only way that we can make it through this life is in the Spirit. Father, we do pray for anyone here who has not trusted Christ for their salvation, that today would be the day that we could rejoice with heaven over the lost one who is found. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.